Hello everyone and welcome back to the Legal Tech Around the World series brought to you by the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law and in Council. Um, we've been delighted to be tracking around the world and uh, looking at what's happening in the legal tech markets there. Uh, we land in Europe today and with that having been said, I'm going to hand over to David Bushby who's a facilitator in just one second. David's the Managing Director of In Council and will be facilitating this session and I'll join you towards the end of the session again. Thanks, David, and over to you. Thanks very much, Terry. And uh, hello, everyone, and welcome back, if you've joined us before, to our fourth instalment of the Legal Tech Around the World series, brought to you, of course, by the College of Law Centre for Legal Innovation. As Terry mentioned, my name is David Bushby from Legal Tech Consultancy slash Lawyer Network In Council also the producer of the weekly Law Hackers newsletter. I'm your host for this series and joining us today, we've got uh, two fabulous panellists leading the charge in the legal tech market in Europe, which is of course our fourth stop on our round the world tour for 2022. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our panellists today. Firstly, we've got Helena Halgan, uh, co-founder Virtual Intelligence VQ and Vice President of ELTA in Europe. Dialing in from Sweden, welcome, Helena. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, and also we've got Sergen Dejanovic, who is founder and CEO of Dejanovic Law and Tech, and also director at ELTA for the Southeast Europe uh, division. Uh, Sergen, welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Okay, and just to give our audience uh, a bit of context on where each of you sort of sit in the legal tech ecosystem, I'd love you for each to just give your express elevator pitch uh, on what you do and what your organization does. Um, Helena, if we could just start with you. Yes, we founded VQ 2010 after working 16 years in, in law firms. And we have built, for example, a, a digital associate that is being used by the legal community in Sweden uh, as, for example, 13 of the 15 biggest law firms are using it daily. And we're working with other stuff for digital digitalization of the legal sector too. Fantastic. And Sergian? Well, um, I like to use two main words uh, when, when describing what I do, and that's legal transformer. Uh, legal transformer essentially means uh, legal entrepreneur or entrepreneur in the legal transformation field. And obviously from the business end, from the um, uh, institutional side, I undertake to uh, help facilitate innovation and technology implementation in the legal field, especially bearing in mind that I'm very active in Central Eastern Europe, which is which can be regarded as a, uh, let's say, a, a bit of immature market comparing to uh, North and Western Europe. Fantastic. Well, look, let's uh, dive into some of uh, the questions or topics that we have for today's session. Um, some of them we kind of tend to ask across all the different jurisdictions as we go. But the, the one I like to keep, kind of keep, kick off with is what are the major headlines, uh, legal tech headlines in your part of the world at the moment? Uh, Helena, do you want to run through anything that's grabbed your attention yeah. in the headlines? Yeah, well, we're a really tech-friendly region and... Recently, we have two big fundings for online legal advisors. Lexley received 17 million euros and Pocket Law received 10 million euros in funding. Uh, and they are just into this legal advice online for consumers or small, small companies. Fantastic. So, yeah, and Lexley has been around since 2004, actually. But, and so, how, how does that compare that, that sort of that sort of funding number is that like a considered to be like a large funding round or, yeah it's or quite it, it's yeah. quite large yeah it's quite large for it actually because this is advisors and now they are are pursuing abroad to different countries so it's quite large fundings in a way yeah uh, can keep them going for a while yeah and else hopefully well, Elsewhere in Europe, I've seen some some big yeah. numbers that we've seen in uh, just this last week. Actually, we saw Dilly Trust, um, which has been around for a long time. I must say, mm -hmm. since uh, I think mm -hmm. the mid '90s, but it's just recently raised 130 million yeah. euros. So one of the That's bigger it. funding rounds I've seen in, in Europe for for a little while. Uh, Dilly Trust, they they sort of 
work in co corporate legal departments, governance platform is probably the way to describe them, but they also have some CLM capability. Uh, and then we've had two in, in well, two, not so much fundings, but one funding in, in Belgium. Uh, Hinchman I saw raised uh, 2 million in, in February this year. And then we've recently seen a, a partnership between a Belgian um, CLM platform, uh, Contractify, uh, partnering with Deloitte Legal, and they've got a, their own product called Legal, which is in the document automation space. So a couple of headlines in, in Belgium as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Jan, how about you in, in, in your part of the world or already anywhere else in Europe that you've seen some, uh, some action happening, creating headlines? Well, David, to be honest, uh, we're nowhere near the, the, the Scandinavian countries and obviously nowhere near uh, when it come, Western Europe when it comes to funding. However, uh, if, if I would like to note and by the last couple of years, what, what is and can be regarded as very significant is the, the ecosystem. So the basically the European legal technology chapter for Southeast Europe, where all the major players came. Uh, so from Deloitte, PwC, um, Schoenhaler, CMS, and so on. And we are seeing some activities. Obviously, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to, to manage this, this group. We're seeing some activities uh, from the law firms to invest in some technology-based uh, projects like NLP for the legal domain and, and, and similar initiatives. Uh, furthermore, I would like to note that, for example, the Innovation Fund of Serbia, which is basically a, a cooperation between the European Commission and Serbian government, trying to uh, motivate uh, uh, innovative startups uh, with funding, uh, they're uh, providing grants, so like equity-free uh, investments uh, from, let's say, we have like smaller 30K to uh, 80k, 100k. However, there is a program which also has some of uh, the legal tech startups applied. Is catapult where they give you some upfront grants, but match your pre-seed in, uh, in investment up to 350k. So if you have like a, a angel investor or like a VC who just wants to 350k put in your startup and in, in, in a pre-seed phase, they match it with another 350k, which is respectable, I think when it comes to early stage startups. So again, uh, uh, seeing, seeing some activities here, but just like to, to remind you that it's still in early stage of development. In a, in a previous conversation, you mentioned that the Serbia legal tech ecosystem is still under construction. Yeah, yeah, again, yeah. That, I, I think that's a good headline. That's a good headline. You know, uh, it, it's like when you're obviously w w visiting a, a page online and said under construction. So it, it, it's it's the it, the process counts, but I believe we'll get to some more interesting stuff when it comes to uh, uh, um, countries like Serbia and all of the uh, countries in Southeast Euro Europe where they can, uh, uh, let's say, also uh, generate value for even global law firms and global players when it comes to legal tech, but uh, uh, a little bit about that um, uh, uh, after this conversation. Yeah. And, and just to sort of stick with trying to, to get a feel for the, the legal tech market in Europe, um, Helena, mm -hmm. I'd love to sort of get, get your, your, your take on, like I've, I've obviously heard about ELTA uh, being in Australia, European Legal Technology mm -hmm. Association, but I, I don't know too much about it. And I understand that there are chapters all over Europe, but yeah, well, um, I'd love for you to just tell us a bit more how that is structured and what role that plays in, in your region. Well, this is an independent community of European legal tech experts and enthusiasts, and we have representatives, ambassadors in 29 countries around Europe and 35 ambassadors in total. We have some, a uh, couple of ambassadors in some countries. And we have a number of members, both personal individuals and corporate members. So it could be some thousand, a couple of thousand members, several thousand members, if you in total, depending on how you count the, the corporations. And the idea is to really support and facilitate networking in the legal tech space and support information and knowledge about legal tech. So that's the whole idea. So we're working, uh, try to make this community, uh, vivid community that really can support the legal tech uh, innovation space. 
and we try to organize webinars and stuff like that. And this year we are able to organ organize an, a, a live event again so we can meet up because the important part of networking is also meet in person. So we have a meet up and, and a, a big event at the end of November in Israel actually, where we focus on practical issues, how to be practical about legal tech. It has been so much theoretical ideas about how to transfer to tech but we now have to move on also how to really use tech in reality yeah so hopefully that can give some inspiration to hopefully yeah how to do that do, do the hard part but i mean it was great <laughs> just just even on this panel and so jan mm -hmm. in, in serbia then yourself uh in sweden i mean it's mm -hmm. truly you all know each other through elta i understand and it's also interesting because it, we in Sweden, we are really technology focused and we're really an innovative and, and a really pro tech and all the bigger law firms. But we get some setbacks too. And that's interesting when you talk about the practical reasons because all the bigger law firms have invested quite a lot in tech and they have uh, heads of technology, heads of innovation, heads of digital services or whatever. But and some years ago, all of them invested in AI solutions, for example, because they thought everything would change. Your due diligence process would completely change by the use of, of AI. And it was really interesting setback just some weeks or months ago, because one of the senior partners in m and in, in the big law firm Rocher in Sweden, was in the headline in the business law, a business uh, daily business paper, saying that these AI tools doesn't really work at all in practice. <laughs> so that was, and that was really admitting that, first of all, it was too difficult to train it in Swedish because it takes too much time and that's quite understandable, but it's also difficult to use them in, in a professional way in the due diligence process because how to train them to understand these kinds of documents, how to evaluate them. So instead they have changed their process of doing due diligence in any way, but it's obvious that these tech tools are not that easy to use as they thought they would be. So this practical part of how to use all of this, we need another round of that, I think. So that that is, I think, what all the law firms will need to focus much more on, how to get better use of all these tech tools. It's not mm. that easy as the salesman says it will be <laughs> all the time. Absolutely. And, and just in terms of we've got uh, ELTA as well, sort of the, the peak body across Europe. So, Jan, you, you also spoke about some other, I guess, hubs or accelerators happening in, in Serbia. Just, just elsewhere, either for both of you, are there, other, are there any missing pieces to the ecosystem? Are there other hubs or incubators or, uh, I guess, organisations like the College of Law, Centre for Legal Innovation that uh, are, are making waves in Europe? Well, to be honest, there are a lot of missing pieces, uh, especially when it comes to ecosystem building. And, and I, I'm very fortunate to, to be able uh, uh, that but basically I'm in a position to facilitate or create the ecosystem from, from, uh, from, from scratch. And what I saw is that there's a huge lack of quality education when it comes to legal tech. And what you have is, um, as a result, you have a mismanaged expectations. So if we're talking about AI, for example, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a survey from Walter School that says that uh, uh, more than 75% of people who talk about AI and blockchain don't know what they are. And when you have a, uh, when you have, um, a, a misinterpretation of what technology can do, then your expectations are always too high. So if we're talking about, okay, how can AI, um, AI make legal services better? Everybody's, everybody's setting the bar very high and say, okay, we're we gonna you know, make an AI contract review that, that's gonna save us a gazillion hours a week and it's gonna do everything by itself. And this is not just uh, my experience from working with top tier law firms in this part of Europe. I'm actually working with Magic Circle law firms with uh, big, four big four companies from also not, not only Central Eastern Europe, but also Western Europe. And, and there's always the gap about really setting the expectations what technology can do and cannot do. So for, I'll just give you an example. I'm, I'm really, really passionate about emphasizing this because it's a huge, it's a huge issue. So yesterday I was doing some presentation for a, for a major corporation here 
Uh, we're also providing legal transformation services, so consulting legal departments how they can improve their internal and external legal processes, right? So I was using PowerPoint, and there is an option in, in, in uh, PowerPoint that says design ideas. So there's an AI who basically suggests how the slides can, can look like, right? So it's not making the slides. I'm not expecting to just put my mind into what, what I want to see and it happens. It's just a facilitator. It helps. And this is Microsoft. It's not legal tech, this is Microsoft. Yeah. And you also see gaps in, in Google AI and uh, Apple AI. So it's it's not perfect. And I feel like uh, everywhere you go, lawyers have expectations that everything is going to be perfect and it always has to solve the major tasks. And always when you talk about lawyers, there's a conversation, is AI going to replace uh, lawyers and so on and so forth. If you talk to engineers, they won't start that conversation. They say, okay, yeah, AI, but what kind of AI? We're talking about NLP, we're talking about OCR. What kind of AI are we talking about? So again, I think the ecosystem for start needs quality education. I see obviously a lot, a lot more of that in, in Western, Western Europe and in Northern Europe. Uh, when it comes to this part, this part of Europe, I, I see a lot of progress. Um, uh, also the, the project I'm doing with PwC, the legal transformation program, I see a lot of progress in that because we have people from uh, Georgia, Estonia, Poland to Albania. And I see a lot of enthusiasm uh, uh, towards this people really trying to learn. And again, this is the, the, this is the cherry on top. When you have quality education, you raise awareness of the problem. You raise awareness of the, of the solution that law firms or, or, or legal departments can, can, can implement. Once you have that, then your market becomes more mature. Then you have requests, okay, can you implement this solution? Because I know what it can do right now. I'm not setting the bar here. I'm setting the bar here. I have an ROI calculation. I have a roadmap. It, it's the proper way things are done. So again, it all starts with education and then you can have a, a, a hope to have a quality implementation of legal tech this is at least my my experience from the market. Mm -hmm. Can can I add something there? Absolutely. Yeah, because I, I I totally agree, and that's a really good point from start. So, and but it is also I think the execution part is failing quite a lot. Even if you have a good plan, the execution part. And it was really interesting. I just saw a report yesterday from from uh, I read in, in Artificial Lawyer that in-house lawyers say that seven, more than 70% of the project, IT project internally failed uh, because the implementation part is not sufficient. So I think we need to put much more effort into that and have a better, as Sergeant says, a better understanding about the complexity. We have to collaborate much better with tech people and have a better, talk with them, get an understanding of it, and not just say, we want this and expect them to understand and implement it the correct way. I think we need something in between the normal lawyer and the tech people, someone that facilitator in between that can, can really support it and implement solution in a better way because it's too many failed projects. And that makes people think that you can't really use tech in, in the way you think. But, I believe you can, but you have to implement it much better than you do today. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's a tough thing to to move from from concept to reality. Uh, the implementation it is, is. is is a big one. Um, it is I, a big one. I, I, I sort of feel that it, in the in the Australian jurisdiction, a lot of the large law firms they they seem seemingly quickly picked up the AI tools uh, and then yeah. and maybe realised some of their limitations quite early on. And I think everyone now knows, at least in this market. Yeah. That, uh, that there's still still a bit of work to be done and a bit of a gap to be to be covered. So uh, it's interesting to get your perspectives on yeah. where things are at with that. Um, I was just wondering in terms of the, the just general adoption, I'd love to sort of get your thoughts, uh, both from uh, the Swedish perspective or the Serbian perspective or, or Europe in general. H how do you feel in general that adoption is going in your part of the world? Uh, general IT develop adoption for all these legal technology, uh, particularly. Yeah, I mean, legal tech. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
I can see that within the like the bigger law firms, they have implemented all kinds of tools. They have document automation. They have all kinds of AI tools for some, and they have all kinds of different tools, and they are really trying to use them. But it's just making their work a little bit more efficient. Uh, but they are really. I mean, we are really a tech-friendly nation and a tech-friendly part of, of the world. So they're really using the tool. But what I, what I would like to see is uh, uh, more new ideas how to use them because they're just using them to get, get a bit more efficient. And really, they should looking they're looking too much into it from the lawyer view actually how the lawyer would like how they usually do the work and how can they change it a little bit by using this tool and not really using the possibilities of the tool instead they should much more look at the consumer side or the user i mean who is buying the legal services what are the needs from them for their side and support them in a much better way. So there, is, there are much, much more possibilities using all of this if you have a much, much more customer centric view of it. So it could be deployed in a much better way. It's just, for example, document automation tools. In most cases it's just filling in forms and making it a little bit faster, but you could use them in a much more intelligent way. So, and that's just one example. You have, they have so many, I don't think they need much more tools really. They need to use them in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Sajan, in, in your experience in Serbia, uh, Central Eastern Europe, plenty of tools no. being used or is it still not, not quite there yet? Well, uh, let's say from, from my experience in working with uh, top tier law firms and let's say, uh, uh, big consulting companies, they always have a tools that are being pushed from uh, their, um, uh, uh, let's say, affiliate uh, uh, companies from the rest of the Europe. So if, if we're talking about, for example, a multinational energy corporation um, in I don't know, Romania, uh, they use Walters Kluwer because the mother company is also using it. So we have the, let's say, the delegation uh, of, of uh, uh, Say obligation of using legal tech from from top to down, right? But I I, I would just like to emphasize one uh, uh, super super important uh, uh, challenge when it comes to uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So aside uh, uh, comparing with, uh, for example, Scandinavia, right? Uh, the prices of legal labor are very high. So, for example, like the, if you have countries like uh, in the in the Balkan region let's say Serbia or Croatia, or even if you go more east, uh, you, you have lower rates of, uh, of, of labor in general. It doesn't matter if it's engineer labor, labor or legal labor, it's very cheap. So if you, if you go to a law firm in, I don't know, Sweden and say, okay, I have a, a, a software that after I implement will save you uh, thousands, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of, of euros a month or annually, they have the math for implementing that solution. But when it comes to uh, um, countries with with low labor, uh, uh, low labor costs, it, it it says basically that they they always prefer to bring aboard a bunch of a, 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 a junior lawyers, yeah, and 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 legal trainees, and say, okay, we have now more people who can handle the workload. You know, so this is an issue, but obviously it can be worked around if you uh, implement technology in a different way, apply some different business models. Not everything is about just saving money. You have, for example, business models that can help law firms scale their service, which obviously they cannot do if, if they do it uh, 100% bespoke. So there, there's a, I think, again, bringing back to, to the awareness part and the education part, I think this, this, is, this is where um, um, uh, people need to know the, the full extent of how you can use tech to, to uh, boost your services. And uh, that being said, uh, I believe that uh, uh, Serbia, the Balkan region, and even a huge part of uh, uh, Eastern Europe has big advantages not not uh, uh, necessarily when it comes to market maturity and selling legal tech there, but for outsourcing some 
uh, engineer or legal work to these countries. We have a history of outsourcing to Ukraine, which is uh, unfortunately now now very hard. But from you know top tier law firms, Magic Circle law firms like Dentist, like Allen Overy, they all have their services centers there. And th this is this is something that's very indicated because the talent is there. You know, I can vouch, for example, I can vouch for for a talent here in Serbia. We have a lot of people that went to uh, Central Europe uh, for to Austria, to Germany after, and uh, also in Scandinavia, have their diplomas, have the knowledge, have know the language, and came back here, especially after COVID. So there's a huge opportunity to outsource uh, some some uh, uh, not only some tasks and some not not some routine tasks, but even expert knowledge when it comes to legal and when it comes to tech. For example, Microsoft Development Center is in Belgrade. It's the most developed, uh, their developed development center in Europe when it comes to NLP, for example, for Word, for Microsoft Office, they develop SQL there. So there, there is a talent pool, it's just a way of, of educating them and managing them to kind of guide them to, to, to uh, legal tech. And I see a lot of opportunities there, yeah. especially bearing in mind that the uh, geopolitical situation is shifting, unfortunately, and that there, there, there are a lot of a lot of changes when it comes to even global strategies uh, uh, regarding uh, Europe, especially Eastern Europe. <clears throat> yeah, I, I can imagine anyone listening in the alternative legal service provider space, yep. Uh, yep. or even founders of legal tech companies looking for that that talent, where that talent. In, in other countries, US, Australia, I know, uh, Europe, uh, as in, in, in London, for example, is extremely expensive and, uh, and, and highly sought after. So I can, I can imagine there's some big opportunities. Yeah. Uh, in, for in sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, in terms of just that split between, we've talked a bit about, oh, we've talked a bit about in-house as well, but just to put the question out there more specifically in terms of adoption, uh, that split between private practice law firms and corporate legal departments, are you seeing any differences between how corporate legal departments versus law firms are adopting technology? It's, well, we, we see that in-house lawyers or corporate legal departments are becoming much stronger. They are hiring more people and they try to deploy some tech, but they are still quite immature, most of them are still quite immature in, in doing that. And uh, that was also the re report from yesterday saying that in, that was more general, but it's quite difficult for these in-house councils to do, to implement tech tools. So instead, but they hire a lot of law lawyers instead. So they are recruiting lawyers and to build their own departments and try to change the way they're working. But I think they would benefit a lot if you have some uh, providers who can help them in a more practical view in implement a tool all the way, not just uh, implemented, but implemented in a way that's really usable from the first day for for these lawyers. So, so there is an open there's open opportunities for anyone wanting to do that. So uh, we see and. And we see this in house councils also becoming stronger, but they're still not organized together that much anymore. So we have an organization for in house councils in Sweden, but it's not that strong, not yet. And that is probably a reason they're not putting the demands on the law firms to change that much. And, and still, uh, the power lies much more in, 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 in the bigger law firms, and they are really doing well, they're really profitable. And, and uh, they are the ones are, that are being ahead, they're using tech and so on, but still they don't really have the real incentives to change since they're working with the billable hours uh, as a business model, most of them anyway. So uh, the, the, there's a need for the in-house councils to become stronger. I think they had to organize much better, like in the US, and organize much better uh, to be able to collaborate and, and say what they really want from, from uh, companies delivering legal advice, that they, they should benefit much more from that. So they, they, there's a change needed, I think, to, to really push, push the change uh, in, towards mm -hmm. using tech. Because it's too difficult. Yeah. If, if you are a small legal department within a big corporation, it's not really focused on your department to deploy tech that's just for your department. It's difficult. And if you're not really used to 
a driving IT project either. I think that's why most of the projects fail because you're supposed to be able to handle that yourself. You're not, you don't have that competence really most of the times. So mm. You need some other competence to do that. So, John, how, how about your thoughts on this? Uh, well, actually, it's 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 very interesting because lately I've I've been talking to to general counsels from from different uh, corporations in here in Serbia and even even in the region. So we're talking about let's say top tier Coca Cola uh, owned companies or I don't know uh, also energy companies and and even in the public sector I've had a very interesting experience. So again, it, it depends who you ask. It depends. Uh, uh, what kind of legal tech are we talking about? But in general, the difference between law firms, uh, not to repeat what, what Helena said, the, different, the, the main difference between law firms and in-house legal departments is their purpose, right? So we have the one that, that has a purpose to make money and the other probably the purpose to do the right job with in a cost-effective way. That's like a very broad, broad uh, observation, right? But Again, uh, I was I was talking to a general counsel from from a Coca-Cola owned company um, a couple of days back, and she said that okay, so we lawyers are used to spending a lot of time on, on contracts on on, on uh, different matters, right? And we are used to working you know uh, uh, big hours um, and and having you know being being buried in paperwork and everything like that. However, the business is identifying more and more that the legal department, when it comes to like the entire enterprise, the legal department lacks in digitization and lacks the efficiency that other sectors like sales, like HR have, right? But the, the thing is that all interconnected. So we're, the legal department is a business unit. It's not just about, uh, uh, it's not just about uh, writing contracts. It's about getting requests from the sales or from the business side. They need to do something ASAP. Mm. They need some a regulatory impact assessment to evaluate if this project is according to applicable regulations, so on and so forth. So there's a huge codependency between the actual business strategy and legal. And the, the business is pushing more and more legal to, to um, uh, 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 boost efficiency of the processes. So, um, I can see obviously that that uh, everybody has an issue with <clears throat> CLM, right? So taking very long to to approve contracts, to amend them, especially when 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 we when we have a situation, for example, when you when sales uh, uh, fills all all the, the the information necessary for the contract, but it's not yet reviewed by legal, and then it's not reviewed by the finance department. So we have a huge gap. Uh, of of uh, 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 in reality things happening, uh, a transaction happening, but the, the 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 contracts are not properly reviewed. They're not properly managed throughout the life cycle, and this is obviously a, a common pain point. However, you we also have issues with IP management. For example, if if you're a if you're a company that has like 500, 800 trademarks, you need to properly manage them, and it's all been done. Uh, the same way. So I see, uh, to be completely honest, I see a lot of movement in, in the in-house uh, uh, lawyer, lawyer, lawyer sphere. Uh, and this is all because the, the company itself, it also depends on the company. If you have a public company that's building roads, they're not too much worried about legal tech, right? But you have, if, if you have a legal department of Google here in Serbia or Microsoft, they need to have that in line with the overall corporate digital strategy. Even, even for example, if, if uh, the multinational corporations have their policies and everything else. So I see a lot of a lot of movement in that space, but not because they truly want to innovate, like legal innovation. They just need to get in line with the rest of the enterprise. But uh, a bottom line is that's a good thing. In, 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 at least in my in my 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 view, it's it's a it's a good thing, and I and I believe that what Helena said, it will also incentivize law firms to come up with new solutions, to come up with new ways to tap into that market, because um, uh, uh, it's 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 it has huge huge potential. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great point yeah. you make. Yeah. The, the law firms don't necessarily have the the the, the wider higher force to, to tell them exactly what they need to do and to, to pull themselves in line. Whereas uh, if an organization has digitized various departments and the organization wants to move 
quickly. It's only ever going to move as quickly as the slowest piece of the puzzle, which if that's legal, well, they'll need to speed up. Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned CLM there a couple of times. It kind of leads into another area. Like, are you finding any particular areas in your country or region, uh, any, well, when I say area, I mean uh, type of legal technology, whether that be CLM or other categories that are really gaining traction at the moment? Well, CLM is gaining traction because every, everyone needs to handle all the, the contracts everywhere. So they're in, in many different ways. And we see different solutions coming out too, trying to be solved everywhere. But I, I totally agree with Sergeant that there's a so more and more need within within a corporate legal department. They need to handle contracts in a much better way. And they need deliveries that way. And and looking for the from the customer view then from legal departments i guess for example if they want to implement uh, they should for example implement a document automation tools for ndas to be able to delegate all that kind of production within the organization without passing through the legal department and then they need to be in, implemented with a playbook and all kinds of rules around it and we don't have anyone doing that really we should i mean that's an open space for deliveries from a law firm so anyone if you can just deliver the whole solution together with the instructions and with playbooks and everything and support the legal department it's a demand for it but we don't really see it in the space so and there is an open opportunity for that's just one example and there's a great need for that we've been talking to to legal departments that really are in the need for it and and there's just one example from it so i mean handling contracts is a big issue mm -hmm. in different ways in different ways of, of the life cycle too to be handled by by all the departments well helena you've you've had two you know, good funding rounds recently in Sweden. Both of them are mm -hmm. in kind of that DIY type legal yeah. platform space. Mm -hmm. Is that indicative of the areas that are gaining traction in Sweden, sort of that DIY type consumer law, or are they outliers and not necessarily no, indicative? But that is yeah, it is indicative because I think there's an understanding there's, there's a need for new kinds of deliveries of legal service because we have the traditional deliveries from the law firms, but we new new kinds of deliveries. And this is anyway an online delivery. You can get access online. You can get access yourself and um, by a subscription way from Pocket Law, you can get access to documents and so on. So what we want to see more, and that's, that is what I think investors are looking for, to find new kinds of deliveries of services and look at it in a new way. So I think it's, a, it's just a starting point, but so far it's just a starting point. I think we will see much more if you, if some of the companies can come up with much more better ways of delivering services in new way, because too much, it's too much focus today in delivering services. You focus too much on the lawyer. It's the lawyer, everything is built around the lawyer who is delivering the solution. If you focus instead on the customer, what do they really need? Mm -hmm. Can you build some services just to get gain access to legal advice? If you focus on the business instead of the lawyer, you can find some new ways. So I think we're just in the starting phase there for, for that. Yeah. And it would be interesting to see what, what if we can see some kind of innovation in that space. And I would love to see it within the more profitable business law segment because it's still mainly for smaller companies and mm. it's not that profitable part of it really. So absolutely. So Jen, any particular legal tech categories that are kicking off in your part of the world? Well, obviously following the, the global trend, CLM is, is um, you know, uh, common topic, <laughs> common topic. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Uh, where everybody starts because, uh, be, where everybody starts because I think document automation is, and is, is something that's closely related to the legal profession. You know, if you think about a lawyer, you think about contracts, you think about uh, a huge amount of documents, you think about, all kinds of different stuff, right? But again, uh, uh, especially big systems with huge administrative um, uh, uh, segments and, and, and parts of the company that work with documents, again, all interconnected, uh, need to be optimized, need to be, need to be closely 
um, uh, closely work with both from the engineering side and, and from the legal side. However, I see, uh, uh, for, for my example, it's, it's uh, CLM as a, although a requirement in, in, in uh, today's um, uh, legal work, I'm mostly focused, for example, on compliance. I'm, I'm focused on, on knowledge management. I think knowledge management is, is hugely underrated when it comes to the importance of your expertise that you accumulated throughout the years being stuck in an email or being stuck in a PDF file, being stuck in, in, in some databases. We all, we, all, um, we all think about what we can do with that accumulated knowledge, for example, if you're a law firm. And uh, the, the issue is for, for example, if, if you have an expert that decides to leave your, uh, leave your law firm or leave your department, he, he or she takes the expertise with them, right? There is no way to, to kind of accumulate that knowledge and to process it in a right way to be able to uh, retain it. And I believe that when it comes to knowledge management, not only uh, 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 databases of, of, of templates of documents or something like that, I, I'm, I'm talking about real legal expertise because that's invaluable. You know, uh, taking, for example, legal advice from a senior lawyer, putting it into, into, a, into a database, for example, using NLP to kind of uh, 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 process, process that natural language in the right way. And, after they generate an, an output that can be reused or used and be valuable to, to other applicable situations. Because if you're a law firm and you will get asked about, uh, is GDPR applied to me? And you will have the same answer to 100, 100 um, for example, 100 clients that are in the same situation. You will that do that uh, uh, from scratch. Obviously, uh, Helena also mentioned the billable hour as still a dominant dominant uh, uh, business model and pricing model. So people don't have an issue of writing stuff from scratch and using some old templates because they got to bill it. However, I still put my money on that because there's a huge opportunity to tap into, into what, uh, what knowledge management really is. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on, on a solution and, and uh, will be soon published uh, that, that will have it, uh, that I believe will have a, a big impact on how not only compliance is being done, but how the knowledge about compliance is being stored and processed, obviously uh, respecting all the confidentiality and everything else. So I, I, I see a lot of room for improvement in that area, not only in the CLM field, but again, uh, if, if your question is, what, what, what do you see more often? You see, obviously, CLM, you see uh, uh, document drafting, document management. This is something that's more, most common. But let's, let's also leave room for other stuff, including like IP management and everything else. So um, I, see, I see a good trend there as well. Yeah, I, it, it does seem to be very much dominated about the, the act of, of contracting in some way. It, it just, uh, I, I agree with Sergeant about this compliance part because in, in Sweden we can see a lot of recruiters uh, recruiting uh, compliance lawyers and, and there's been a boom of that really and at the same time there's actually a great need for tools for uh, whistleblower solution ALM controls and all that kind of stuff so this is also an opportunity if you could organize and build tools and and the whole whole implementation phase and help these companies to handle these kind of issues. So that is also great. And we we have seen the the come upcoming of a couple some tools that are getting getting uh, traction here too. Yeah. So that's an interesting part too. Well, I'd love to um just get your thoughts, kind of just to round out the conversation around challenges. What what would you think? And maybe to stick with you, Helena. What would you think would be the main challenge or challenges that uh, legal tech companies are facing in, in Sweden? If we maybe just stick with uh, your jurisdiction on that question. I think the, the main challenge will be the implementation to make really good use of the tech tools because we have loads of tech tools and we have to get a much better use of them and see better our ROI in practice using them. So I think the great opportunity is here to really use them better. 
And, and what, <laughs> what, it, what, I mean, what do you think that is? Is that uh, is that opportunity for? Uh, is that is that be- better tools that are easier to use or? No. Better onboarding or consultants to help with implementation. I think in, yeah, well, I think you need some f- f- facilitators in between because to implement them to get a better to get a better business case, you have to get a bit of business case. What do you really want to use them for? Find out the business case and then decide on what tools to use because you have a wide variety of tools to, to use, and then implement it and in a way that's really customer friendly and user friendly and it's too much shiny use of tools you they look nice and have a nice user interface but the user experience doesn't really work the way it should be and that's in almost all the projects i see and i also see with with legal tech new legal tech solution the user experience hasn't been they haven't been thinking it through and i think there's a much better need for better feedback because everyone is appraising all these legal tech tools and it's really great and I, I, it's really great we have all the tools we have all the new initiatives and, and it's really positive but some of them should also get some better feedback if they want to listen to them and try to make them a little better you have to be more they need more constructive feedback to change them a little bit make them more focused on the user experience because they are lacking that quite a lot so that is what we need more of and then that if we get that we won't get all these failed it projects that's being talked about all the time like the report yesterday said more than 70 percent of in-house councils seen in a IT projects and they fail, it's because they haven't been implemented the right way and being used the right way. I think mm. we need new people doing that. Well, it's a big challenge that's set to probably only get get worse if if the if the sort of the funding landscape for CLM is any indication of uptake in terms of purchasing CLM. Uh, there's going to be a whole load of customers coming on board uh, yeah. in the near future, or at least I, I hope the the VCs see it that way, uh, so the implementation piece will 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 explode as, as a challenge. Um, I would have thought. Yeah. Uh, so, Jen, how, how about you? Biggest legal tech challenge uh, in in Serbia or, or neighbouring neighbouring regions? Well, when it comes to challenges, I I, I won't stay uh, in in Serbian frames. Uh, I would I would like to discuss also like. Uh, from a broader uh, Eastern European perspective. Um, so first of all, uh, I don't like to repeat myself, but education, I already talked about it. Mm-hmm. I think it's super important to, as a starting point, as, as foundation. Secondly, I, I truly believe that politics, the culture, uh, when it comes to the mindset towards technology, it needs to be shifted because um, uh, even, for example, even the if the leadership uh, is is um, committed to innovation, they need the entire uh, organization to to follow. And when we talk about, for example, when we talk about um, uh, law firms, big law firms, uh, if if you have a senior partner, if having a managing partner, and say, okay, we're gonna go with uh, with this tech stuff, um, if the, the 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 middle middle layer and the low layer just don't have time for it or don't want to have time for it it's not going to happen you need like whole adoption on all verticals to to be able to to follow the 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 the, the path that is being even and that's under the assumption that leadership uh is is committed to to uh to uh, legal transformation and uh, I see a huge challenge, a huge gap in overselling legal tech and over, you know, as, as Helena said, uh, it's all very shiny. It's all, you know, you're uh, promising like disruption, you're promising this, and you're promising that. And uh, uh, Helena said, talked about the failed implementations. Uh, the implementation phase is always the ri- most risky when it comes to any industry in any 
in any project, obviously planning is, is a lot easier, but bearing in mind that, that especially in, in a lot of uh, cases, agile project management is being used and lean is being used. So it's not too hard to pivot when you want to implement uh, a quality solution. So I think in, 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 in every use case, you can find some value, but if you're overselling it, if you're over expecting the what, what's, what's going to happen, and you're not focused on specific ROI, specific use cases, specific uh, uh, application, what technology can do, I see that that uh, the probably the project is is bound to fail, especially when we talk about legal tech startups. Um, and I and I see uh, in in the startup phase, uh, if you have good mentoring, good funding, uh, um, obviously experience in that, uh, it's super hard to go from zero not to 100 from zero to one because i see a lot of startups being being uh, uh um founded and and pushed from uh lawyers that never had experience in entrepreneurship never had experience with startups and they kind of engage with hurdles and challenges that are not used to them so uh again uh, um uh, i believe that uh, uh Educate, have a quality education, know, know the specific applications of technologies, know the market, know everything else. Secondly, uh, try to, it's, I think that's the hardest thing, but politics and, and um, uh, culture are very, very difficult. That, that's why sometimes it's best to, go, to avoid law firms. You know, with all due respect, I, I was a lawyer. I, my, my mother is a lawyer. I, I believe that lawyers have a crucial role, obviously, in the legal, uh, uh, legal profession. However, uh, when it comes to legal tech, sometimes it's better to maybe focus on legal departments or focus on B2C segment, something. Because if you just focus on, especially major law firms, the culture, the, the mindset, it's too overwhelming. Sometimes it's or and I'm talking about from from my experience and and uh, just just think about twice when you're when you're working with and it's not just about law firms you have notaries you have other different let's call them institutions in the legal world that are very very hard to change so and when you talk about scaling when you talk about everything else just think about uh, uh, the stakeholder expectations and how you can manage them and at the end don't oversell your legal tech products. It's not science fiction. It's not gonna fly, it's not gonna go back in time. Be focused on specific benefits, how you can help your target market step-by-step step to, to generate some value for their organization or their client's organization. You be very specific. And um, I, I think that that's, that's the key takeaway, at least from, from my end. Yeah. Uh, for, yeah, for this issue. Yeah. Well, some good, uh, good, good advice and insights there from from you, sir, Jen and uh, uh, Helena. You've come off mute. Did you have any final words before yeah. we hand no. over back to Terry no. and, and wrap up? Yeah, well, I just saw the quote from Steve Jobs that agreed with me about this. And I or I agree with him. He said, "Ideas are not are worth worthless unless executed, and execute, execution is worth millions. And that is the key point here. The execution, execution, the implementation and all that, that's the key here. And we, if we get better implementation and execution of all these ideas, they're going to be a big change. Yeah, some wise words to wrap up. But uh, look, to Jen, Helena, thank you so much for your time. I know it's uh, quite early in the morning, early start for you guys and appreciate it. Uh, Terry, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, David. And, and let me add my thanks also to you, Helena and Surgeon. Great discussion. It, I was really struck by the number of times the word opportunity was used. So I'm going to take that as kind of the key phrase from this one in a way that there's so many opportunities that will obviously will show themselves up in a whole bunch of different places. But uh, and also, again, David, struck by the similarities that we're seeing as we kind of uh, take our trip around the world as well. Certainly some differences as well, but lots of similarities there, too. Indeed. So um, with that having been said, thanks everyone also for attending. Really, really enjoyed having you here. And um, you'll find all of these folks on LinkedIn. I know that because uh, I found them there too. So do reach out and contact them because I know they're also open to that. 
Um, if you'd like to explore any of the things that we discussed here today in more detail, um, make sure that you do that. And you'll certainly find also the centre and in council in all of those normal social media places that you would go as well. So do connect with us and continue to follow us through all of that. Um, we are back on the 27th of July. So we're not doing anything next month. The next one will be in July and we'll be back with uh, the USA and Canada and kind of on the, the home stretch in terms of this series on legal tech around the world again. So with all of that being said, again, thank you so much for an amazing discussion. And thank you everyone again for facilitating. And David, uh, thank you again, another wonderful job at facilitating the discussion as well. So until July, um, bye. Bye, see you then. Bye.